think we can start to get started. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Audrey Lobopula, um, who's going to speak on evaluating government policies using open source models. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, for me, it, it really is awesome to be here today, and um, I'm Audrey, um, and I'd like to um, first share with you a story that um, is the precursor to a lot of this work. Um, so, yeah, last, last year, on the second Tuesday of May, um, as with every other year, the federal government delivered its annual budget, and just like thousands of other Australian households, um, I watched eagerly, waiting to hear these, those announcements come forth. Um, announcements like um, the proposed abolition of the carbon tax, changes to our social welfare system, changes to what I, you know, one of my passions, research funding and a higher education system, and a whole lot more. And, you know, I, I could tell watching that, that there was going to be a new wave of public debate sweeping through um, our society. Here's why. Public policy is such a diverse range of that they're bound to impact almost every one of us. And sometimes they affect areas of our lives that we feel really passionately about. And so I guess that this is why there's such a vibrant discussion about, about policy. So... Australian citizen, a mother, and a scientist, I had a whole lot of questions buzzing away in my mind. How does this budget affect me and my family? How will it affect our kids? How will it affect our future? Will the abolition of certain taxes and changes to public policy be sustainable? And yeah, the scientist part of me. What are these estimates based on anyway? What were the assumptions used? How was this modelled? Is the source code. More importantly, how do we measure policy impacts? And how accurate are they anyway? So, today I invite you to step through the looking glass with me into a world where knowledge, data, and analysis is freely available to every one of you. Let's take this one step further. Freely available to use, modify, and distribute without restrictions. Now imagine a society where you could access any hypothetical questions using a simple app on your mobile phone. Where would free access? What would that mean for policy debate? How would this change our world today? In this presentation, my quest is to take you on my personal journey into a parallel universe where public policy modeling and analysis is a dynamic collaborative effort between government and its citizens. So fasten your seatbelts. Um, we are going on a sci-fi journey. My goal is to leave you asking even more questions when you leave my leave this talk than when you came in. And that's because I believe that that is the real catalyst to progress. So before embarking, I should add that um, these are my personal views. Um, they, they, are not, they are not necessarily um, the views of the Australian government. There will be some time for questions um, at the end, and I, I really encourage them because um, it, I would really value um, your feedback and your input. The other thing to note is that some of the examples I use are specific to the Australian government, but um, the concepts can be widely applied to any other country. So, when it comes to numbers, to quantifying the impacts of public policies, what's, what's the status quo? Numbers are powerful, right? We, we know this. They are usually used to give credibility to an argument, to support um, policies, to support the rationale for changing policies to um, 
introduce new policies, change taxes. Um, so num numbers and costings are, are pretty, pretty important. And at the moment, um, citizens are free to access the cost to these to, to um, through their annual budget, economic outlooks, um, intergenerational reports, and other sort of publications. But um, times have changed. Today, as we progress to an even more digitally transformed society, we expect a lot more from the way that this information is delivered to us. And a static presentation of numbers in a publication is no longer going to be sufficient. In the world, reporting of information, forecasts, trends, and estimates of policy costs is going to be dynamic and even an interactive process. And I'll take this step further, it's going to allow citizens to modify um, and distribute it. So the other day I, um, I left my phone on to charge and um, my three-year-old three son was, was building some Lego and anyone who's had any familiarity with three-year-olds, uh, when things got really, really quiet, that's when you got to start to worry. <laughs> And yeah, it went really quiet and um, it sort of sent shivers down my spine, so I went to investigate. And what I found was my son swiping through my photos, editing them, navigating them um, like a pro, um, like it was almost second nature to him. And here's the thing, I thought how to use this before. So look, it, being the scientist in me, it got me marveling at how far we've come with user interface. Um, user interface design and how easy it is nowadays um, to do various things like create websites using WordPress um, and how much sophisticated we've become today uh, with our digital interfaces. And um, it got me thinking, if WordPress can make web design so much easier than the average, why can't we do that allows people to easily interact with their policy environment using a simple app? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it be amazing if we had an app that allowed us to see how changing public policies impact us individually and as a nation? How it impacts the rich, how it impacts the poor, um, students, professionals, the old, the young. How it impacts us today and how will it impact us 50 years um, ahead? So what, what we're talking about is creating a model that users can test drive through various virtual policy environments and make up their own minds about the sort of future that they want to create. Uh, I love this quote. Uh, there's a rule of thumb on the internet that says you should never trust a car analogy, so I decided to use one. <clears throat> so, imagine you were given the key state-of-the-art public policy model. After a little practice, you figured out the key indicators to watch the dashboard, you know the, um, the fuel indicators, um, brake lights, etc. And um, let's, let's parallel, like, let's mirror this for our economy. Um, the ABS of statistics has created this um, really interesting dashboard, which they call um, the economic dashboard. And it's got four main indicators on there, your society, um, which has things like health, um, safety, a whole bunch of things, economy, environment, and governance. So they're kind of like your, your dash, economic dashboard. Um, and you can see that in some areas, for example, um, in um, there's a big cross against the resilient economy. So that's kind of like the danger, the danger um, mark there. Other areas, um, uh, let's say society and health, we, you know, Australia's doing fairly fairly well. So this kind of gives you a snapshot of how, how we're progressing. But again, um, I think we could take this a step further. I think we need to make this an interactive um, dashboard and a dashboard where you could actually drive, drive this model. So, so rather than a snapshot, um, we can actually take this a step further. So yeah, if, if you were driving the model, after some practice, you're fairly confident, you instinctively know how to run this machine, which maneuvers you can get away with, because I, I, know, I know I do that when I drive. Um, and um, yeah, imagine if, if you could navigate through the controversial terrains of public debate 
because you are the one in the driver's seat. You know your track and you know your model really, really well. It's incredibly, incredibly powerful. Uh, now let's imagine that each and every citizen had access to this model. Politicians, media, lobby stakeholders, everyone. What do you think this world would be like? Moreover, what if the government provided these citizens um, the source code um, to use, modify, distribute freely? Where, where would we be? Ah, and this is my, my little pet. Um, I, I, I call these policy models government open source models, or affectionately um, GOSMs. Um, and GOSMs are really the heart of this presentation today. So what exactly is a GOSM? It's an open source policy model, and a policy model usually involves the creation of a virtual society with its own economic or policy infrastructure. Ah, yes, this is probably sounding a lot like a computer game to um, some of you guys. Um, but the main point of creating this virtual society is to test out different public policies and analyze their outcomes. And um, why, why is this useful? It's, it's, inc it's incredibly important for decision making. Deciding whether certain programs should be run, certain funding should be cut, certain taxes should be put in. It's, it's a sort of environment you could um, test drive test drive your policies in. So now I know what you're thinking. Uh, you're thinking, how, how good are these models? How accurate are they? What, what are the specs? Um, how complex or how, how complicated are they anyway? And um, being, being nerds, we, we tend to think, um, hey, let's, let's get to the code. Let's, let's have a look at the source code. I'd love to see what, what drives this, this model. But wait. Policy modeling and analysis are currently one of those jobs that you need to have a um, caution, authorized personnel only signpost at the front. For almost as long as we've had our demo de democracy, it's a partnership effort between politicians and bureaucrats. But today we're on the verge of something new, something new and exciting. With government open source models, society and government has the opportunity to tap into new and undiscovered capabilities for creativity, innovation, and efficiency. And what we have is a three-way partnership. Um, Gossams will open up the playing field for geeks. Traditionally, policy, analysts, pol policy has been generated by a few sources like lobby groups, think tanks, um, academics, the media, and government agencies. But um, I, I propose that we've got, we've got um, a third party there, and um, we've, got, we've got the geek in the story. So in the past, um, you, may, you may wonder, well, why haven't we been involved um, in this process before? And, and the reason is that the public in the past has not actually had access, such easy access, um, to data like we, we do today. Um, open data is um, a big thing nowadays, but about 10 or 15 years ago, it wasn't um, as successful as it is today. The other, the other big thing about policy analysis is that it's actually hard stuff. Um, figuring out the quantitative information involved is it's difficult, it's specialized, and um, the average person usually runs away from math. But this is going to change. Um, the specialized knowledge that we need for this kind of task is, I, I think, break, is breaking, broken down into a f, um, three main parts. And one is um, economics. People need to be a, a bit familiar with economics. Um, the second is a um, numerical kind of background, math, stats, computing, in my case, uh, um, physics, um, which is a bit out there, but hey. <clears throat> and the third part is um, uh, knowledge about tax and policy and legislation. So um, there's, there's three main, main components to, to this kind of work. And so the general perception is that this kind of work is pretty, pretty tough. It actually means that um, in public debate, when you sit there and listen to what's happening, people actually don't, don't really question the numbers. They question policy. They question how things should be done, um, whether, thing, whether things are done um, the most efficient way. But... But when, when numbers get thrown out there, um, 
usually people tend to accept them. And um, this talk is about questioning whether or not certain policies cost what they say they're going to cost. And, and for someone like me, what, what the assumptions were um, behind, behind those numbers? Where do they come from? The source code, essentially. So, now we're ready to tackle on a um, case study policy problem. Remember, the same underlying concepts apply to any other topics such as climate change, migration, uh, pensions, the global financial crisis. But for you guys today, today's special case study, we will be focusing on a rather controversial debate. It's going to do the event that Humpty Dumpty falls off his wall. In this example, um, let's, let's, I mean, let's narrow our scope just examining the tax consequences. As you'd expect, there's a fair amount of media coverage on this issue. Um, both sides, the skeptics who think that Humpty is on fairly safe ground and he ain't going to fall anytime soon. And um, we also have the doomsayers who say that his fall is going to happen um, any, any minute now. So, you're all as As a model developer, some of the questions you might want to ask are, one, what's, what's the likelihood of, of, this, of this fall going to be? Two, how are we going to estimate the cost of this fall to society? And three, how would we be able to cover the cost of this, this fall? So, as with any data policy modeling process, the first step is information gathering. Being able to identify data sources, which information is important, information is relevant, which information is useful. And here we've got um, a diagram that sort of sketches out the process of um, how you'd go about modeling um, the, uh, the answers to those questions. So what, what you can see here is you've got um, three main components. One's your data, which is um, often collected by the Bureau of Stats. Um, survey data, government administration data. Um, just look at your data itself. Um, you actually get a lot, a lot of information that tells you about how things are going at the moment. Um, and and this, this, this analysis is, is invaluable. Um, today, government has employed very unique ways of um, getting the public involved in, in this process. And GovHack, um, as some of you know, has been incredibly successful. It allows us um, to visualize open data. Um, and we've made um, a, lot of, a lot of progress in, in that area. But um, what I'm proposing is the second step, which is to actually release the model itself. So not just the data that gets put into your model, but the source code that actually does the, um, the virtual policy environment. So why, why do we need the model? What, I mean, what, What's, what does it do? So I, I guess, um, based on what I've seen, um, the models are mainly used for two reasons. The first is to test out your hypothetical um, policies that you want to propose and see how effective they are, um, whether they um, apply to the people that you want them to apply to, whether they, they get enough revenue. And the second reason is, to, is for forecasting to see how things are going to be um, in 50 years' time or um, for the next generation, for yeah. example. The accuracy of your model depends on various things like your data. And finally, after you run your model, you get your output, which is a quantitative measure of how effective the policies are. But, of course, like with any program and any model, um, it's only really as good as the data you put in. And often... Um, the output that you get out needs to be moderated or benchmarked, and that information then feeds back into your model to make your model even better. Um, and so it's, some, it's, it's like a bit of a um, cyclic process where um, you fine-tune you fine your model based on the output and based on your observations of um, what's happening in, in society. So, output. Highly contested. This is the stuff that um, newspapers run with. Um, this is where you get, you know, people arguing from both sides about the numbers. But 
mostly um, the numbers are just ex accepted as is, but this is where I think um, we need to start, start questioning. So what, I, what I, I'm proposing again is to sort of get these um, gossams out, out to the public. So I want to have a look at how, as a developer, so we've kind of talked a bit about how um, useful it is for users, but as a developer, what's, what's inside the gossam? How, how, do you, how do you write one? So a gossam consists of four main cogs um, in, gen in general. The first is your to consider you know, what, what language do you use, Python, um, and what exactly do you write? Um, it's, so it's code um, which is a translation of legislation. So legislation is a, a bunch of and you're trans translating that language, in a sense, into um, your code, Python, for example. Set up this virtual environment. You have a few economic assumptions, like, um, all right, how, what are the assumptions? Um, how, how is our population going to grow? What's, what's the migration level? What's the fertility rates? Um, what's going to happen to our GDP? And, and there are your assumptions that, that drive the model, which you can change um, and will give you a different output. There's your behavioral economics, um, things like um, with the Humpty Dumpty case, for example. Well, if you change your policy um, and put a really high tax on, sit, you know, on sitting on walls, um, maybe you won't have eggs doing that, and that would then change the output of your model. And um, last part is the, um, the policy implementation. So um, it's, it's nice to have um, the policy written in, in legislation, but then is the task of trans making that translation from, from legislation into code. So we're off. We're, we're now ready to tackle even, even the toughest of policy challenges. And every one of you could develop a model. Okay. But the biggest challenge for government about this is releasing policy models and finding a balance between transparency and privacy. How do you protect citizens' privacy and autonomy? Providing the output to a closed source model does have its risks. Um, so if I, if I provided out the source model and I provided um, the output to the model, could, it, in theory, someone reverse engineer that to figure out what the closed data was? Um, and I, an example would be your tax return. If, if people file their individual tax returns and I created this model that read it all in and um, I, I provided you with the model and the output of what was um, the model, could, in theory, someone then reconstruct what your tax return um, information is going to look like? And that's, that's, that's the real challenge here. Um, the other thing is that government um, isn't just um, in isolation. It is also responsible for the integrity of our pol policy environment and our national security. Um, so unlike a private company, it does, it does have its other, other responsibilities. For example, um, if government were to release models on um, tax compliance activities or um, national defence, could that pose considerable threats? Um, and it may not actually be, be in the public interest. So making that distinction um, is, is, not, is not really that easy about whether um, an issue is, is a threat to um, national interest or not. So could, could gossips be exploited to do more harm than good, I guess, is, is, the, is the question. And um, b before releasing any government modelling, it's really important to consider the potential for abuse by individuals um, and entities such as organised crime. So, yeah, that's, that's a tough one to deal with. And then there's licensing. Software developers open source software today are really aware of the issues um, relating to ownership of open source licensing. But um, a government model has a slightly different take on it. And that's um, partly because government's funded by the taxpayer, and they also need to consider um, liability issues, um, particularly as government has a, has a duty of care to its citizens. So if we released a model and um, something happened, would, um, would government be liable for that? So that's, you know, that's, that's a bit of an issue as well. 
Um, hypothetically, I think um, governments could uh, be responsible for maintaining a code repository and incorporating the beneficial changes from the public um, into an, an official version. So that policy um, would be the ultimate winner. But, um, but this is actually open source with a slight difference. Usually when code is developed, um, it's developed with a specific outcome in mind in terms of um, its usability, um, in terms of its functionality, and in terms of achieving an end goal. But um, can gossams be actually used to distort information? Can, can it be exploited by um, lobby groups to sell their own perspective on, on what things um, should be like? Um, will, will, will groups try and serve um, their own personal interests. But the, the key with, with open source is that with open source, there's also transparency. So in theory, um, you would be able to see the underlying assumptions that these um, other models, I think, new territory where po um, political philosophies are subjective and the abilities of models are incredibly numerous. And what you end up with is an information explosion. Which brings us to um, big data, buzzword. Um, data science and big data. IBM describes a data scientist as having a foundation in uh, computer science and applications, modeling, statistics, and analytics, and math. And, you know, it's a pretty big task. It's a pretty big ask. Um, you you kind of need a superhero to be across across all those um, skills. And the thing is that um, it's actually been really well publicized in the media that over the next few years, we will actually be experiencing a global shortage of data scientists. And, and as I said, it's because it requires a specific combination of skills. Um, in fact, what's happening today is that um, private companies are actually employing teams of people with um, specific skills to sort of try and cover what they expect from a data scientist. Ah, but this is where you guys, the open source community, really excels. By engaging the open source community, you have access to such a diverse range of skills. I mean, you're not really talking about a team of five. You've got a team of as big as the open source community is, and that's, that's just taking it that order of magnitude better. Diversity is the key to innovation. Government has an incredible opportunity of tapping into this valuable resource to come up with unique solutions to even the most complex policy problems. And they're unique because every individual here has a unique way of problem solving. So we need you. Don't, don't you love this pic? I mean, the first time I saw it, it was on the um, Gov... Um, 2.0 blog, and I just kind of jumped out of my seat and thought, oh, I wonder who else has been looking over my shoulder. But um, yeah, it, it caught me off guard, and um, it, it's because of the and it sends a message to each and every one of you that your contribution is actually really very important. Oh, penguins. Policy is make. It's engaging, and it's really important. It allows you to have a shared vision about an issue you feel passionately about. It allows you to get behind things that you really believe in. But this time, with open source models, you'll be the one in a position of power. You'll be the one in a position of influence. Each of you has the power to influence public debate in a unique way, and play a role by shaping our public policy and shaping our future. So how can we increase citizen participation? It's imperative that these models are open source because they notionally belong, belong to the taxpayer, because they're, they're essentially funded by the taxpayer. And we need to minimize any barriers to entry, not, not just for transparency, but so that citizens can become more involved in the development part, part of um, public policy issues. And what this means is that we, um, the access to technology and GOSMs um, need to be convenient. 
Now, according to the ABS, I think they said um, approximately 85% of um, Australian households have access to the internet, and that was back in 2012-13. And um, it's, I mean, it's, it's quite high, but not as high as I would have would have thought. If we expect our citizens to contribute to policy modelling, shouldn't government provide them with the necessarily, necessary tools? Um, and that's not just access to computers. Um, it's also access to education in open source programming skills um, in schools. And what if, and um, more than that, I think that um, programming um, in an open source language, knowing that a model is going to be publicly released, is actually quite different from um, programming in a language that's closed. And, that's, and I think it's partly the mentality. When, when you're writing code for just yourself, you're more likely to cut corners. Um, and write in a slightly different style than you would if your model, if you knew your models were going to be released, or that was your intention. Um, and so, from a developer's perspective, I think when you start off writing writing your code, you're in a completely different mindset if you feel like your code needs to be put out as open source. So, if we do participate in policy modelling, each and every one of us, what what can we expect? I, from my personal experience, I say um, be prepared to gain valuable insights into how policies affect your lives in ways that you, you never expect. Um, and, and the other big thing is be prepared to see how policies interact with other policies in ways you don't, don't expect either. And it's, it's, it's un, uncharted territory in a sense. As, as you explore, you'll discover many, many other secrets about the world that you live in. Now, the, the next question, I guess, is we've, you know, we've talked about how useful it is to the public, but what about the policy itself? Um, from a policymaker's point of view, the possibilities are endless. Having a whole ecosystem of virtual models created by every single individual, I mean, this is thinking very big, um, how exciting, how exciting. Improved access to computational power has seen the policy development process transform into an, a dynamic and iterative process at the moment. So because you've got such high um, computational power, what, it, what essentially ends up happening between bureaucratic, bureaucrats and politicians is that they go through this iterative process of, um, well, we've got this policy. Can you please figure out how much that's going to cost us? And because we're able to turn around um, that information so quickly, um, there's even more questions and even, even, even um, a larger range of policies. But now imagine if it's not just your bureaucrats, but your entire community doing this. You will just have, you know, a, a lot of information. But more than that, having so many models out there, I mean, that an, an ecosystem will blow it out of the water. Imagine a virtual environment where each policy model or GOSM, with its own uniqueness created by each and every one of you, now interacted with the other models that each and every one of you created. And what you essentially end up with is like um, a, survival, a survival of the fittest. So you have your own individual poli um, hypothetical policies interacting with everyone else's hypothetical policies. And you could construct an environment where um, the most fittest policy survived or the most optimal policies to society survived. Um, that's, that's just awesome, isn't it? You wouldn't have to have one or two individuals sitting there thinking about policy ideas. You just have such a plethora. And I even promised myself not to talk about genetic algorithms, but there you have it. Okay. One more thing about government open source models. Have I told you how great they are? Government open source models, GOSMs, have the potential to be a public good. Um, now... When I studied economics and my uni professor, as with most um, economic professors, would always use um, a lighthouse as the canonical example of a public good. And you see, the pu a public good has two main definitions. The first one is that it's non-rival. So light from the lighthouse, um, if you receive light from the lighthouse, it does not reduce anyone else's capacity to receive light from the lighthouse. And that's why it's non-rival. Um, your, you know, your consuming that good isn't affecting anyone else's consumption. And the second is that it's non-excludable. Um, 
it's not possible to exclude anyone else from using it. So light out there is not just meant for one ship. You can't exclude ships from, from using that light. And, and that's what um, the definition of a public, public good is. And um, I, I mean, I thought public goods are pretty cool, but the physics nerd inside me got even more excited because with, with open source models, it's even cooler. And here's why. Um, because you are able, able to modify, distribute it, Imagine yellow light, yellow light coming out there and a ship was able to convert that to an orange light and then beam that back out so you have yellow and orange and another ship comes past and um, converts the light to blue light and suddenly you've got you know, this complete amazing light show. But I didn't think my professor, my economics professor actually got the concept of that at the time but I was, I was in a buzz um, being the physicist and, and stuff. But yeah. Um, so essentially what I'm saying is that you have your traditional public goods, but open source has the potential to take public goods to a completely different dimension. Yeah, so um, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things in the world is um, to, read, to read to my three-year-old son before he goes to bed. And... Um, my story is that I spend most of my life um, studying math, physics, um, doing a lot of Fortran programming, and it's where I felt really comfortable. Um, Fortran programming, for those who are old enough to know what is, um, you probably don't want to go there right now. Um, and I had almost no interest in public policy whatsoever. I, I was lucky if I, if I actually, and this is really embarrassing, but I was, I was really lucky if I knew who the Prime Minister was. Um, I was that, that buried in, in what I was doing. And then one day I thought, you know, how cool would it be if I could apply my quant quantitative skills to something, um, to some less esoteric application? Yeah, well, policy. And what I discovered completely blew me away. I learned that public policy was a new land waiting to be explored by nerds. See, I get emotional about this stuff. And, um, and government open source models has the potential to be a legacy that we leave to future generations. Um, yeah. And that's, that's what I believe is the spirit of democracy. Thanks. Um, before we open up for questions, I just want to um, dedicate this talk to my three-year-old boy, um, who's my inspiration, and um, a special thanks to all my friends in the public service who have enjoyed long and arduous discussions about um, a lot of this content. Um, so thanks to you guys. Questions? Thank you. Um, yeah. If anyone has questions, just ask for them. Um, firstly, it was a great talk, and I, I love the passion with which you spoke for policy. I mean, Thank you. It's not usually you think people get so massively passionate, but, but it was very engaging. Um, my question is, you mentioned a shortage of data scientists, and I know a heck of a lot of people I thought had the skills for data scientists. So um, two questions. What are the skills for a data scientist, and who out there funds data scientists to do data science? I know a lot of people who do com something completely different because there's no money. Hmm. Um, data science is actually the new thing. What, what they actually, um, so there are a lot of people who are from um, a lot of different types of skills. Um, I think the predominant ones are uh, statistics, um, information visualization, and um, your hardcore programmers, really. So someone who's across across um, all all that stuff. Um, and people have different strengths and weaknesses, but um, in terms of um, employability, there's a lot of companies, and it's, this, is a, this is a trend starting in the US at the moment, where um, private organizations are going to end up with really huge amounts of data because um, we, we're now collecting all sorts of data from your mobile phones, um, and not just data in terms of numbers, but metadata. And what we end up with is this huge amount of data that um, people need to be able to be cluey enough to figure out what it actually means. So companies um, are starting to look at things, I mean, even business companies in terms of sales, are starting to look at how do you appeal to different clients, 
um, based on you know their um, their usage of certain internet sites or um, which which w what their clients actually are interested in. So it's a huge amount of information, um, and the skills um, and, and yeah the skills shortage is is a bit of an issue. And so what what's actually happening now is that universities in the U.S. are running specific data science degrees, but they can't churn them out fast enough. Um, but I, I think I think the open source community has um, has a, a distinct advantage in, in in that space because I mean this is what we do best we we problem solve um, because of the size and innovation that we're able to tap into. It's not restricted to just five individuals hired for specific skills. It's an, it's it's open to everybody. Hi. Um, so I like the idea of this ecosystem where a lot of policies can kind of uh, that are trying to have the same goal can exist. Um, the one thing I don't know how to address with that is what about when people actually have different opinions as to what the outcome of the policy should be, i.e. What, uh, what figures they should be trying to maximise out of that and end up with different types of policies that uh, might be the best in what they do but actually have different end results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's that's a really good really good question. Um, I guess with Gosms, the the key thing about that is transparency, and it's about um, people understanding where the numbers come from. So, what my my vision is is to have the debates about what policies should be employed, um, used um, as in the seconds of policy discussion. We should lots of um, um, using numbers as a way to hide behind, uh, using numbers to hide behind um, what we actually believe in. So our discussion should be about what we want to want the end result to be, um, and then once we dis determine what policy we're actually interested in, then determining what the optimal way or pathway is to get to that using the ecosystem approach. But I completely get your point because if different people have different views, then how do you determine the survival of the fittest and which one, which one wins? So I think that kind of discussion, I mean, that's, that's for each and every one of us based on our political philosophies to discuss. But when, when you um, elect your government representative um, and a decision is made, then um, achieving that outcome and the optimal way to achieve the outcome in, in a sense of um, satisfying the most number of citizens or having um, the least amount of tax burden, I guess, um, that's, that's where the um, creativity comes in. Does that, yeah. Is there anyone else? Yeah. And, and kind of really follows on from that, and I, I sort of myself while talking about genetic algorithms, and perhaps this is a, a chance to talk more. I mean, instead of people developing these models, could they be I say bring it on, um, and, and this is this is the beauty about open source, right? Like you've got the freedom, the freedom to do that if if that's what, what you choose. Um, and from my personal perspective, I think I think the more the better because we're sort of covering covering. I mean, the more the more species you have in your in your ecosystem, I think makes for a more exciting world. Um, Uh, yes, yes and no. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. I think that um, there is a danger about having too much information. For example, um, the other day I went out to um, buy some toothpaste and um, I'm usually used to my one brand and they didn't have it and there were so many brands and it confused me. It really did. And um, they have done studies in economics, in, in behavioral economics, that sometimes when you give people too much of a choice, it's actually harder for them to make a decision. Um, than when they're actually given, given less choice. Um, and that's, that's part of how our, our neurology, neurology works. So in terms of decision making, whether we should be getting humans to decide it or machines to decide it, um, I guess I go back to my previous, my previous answer in that um, I want to empower us to make our own decisions based on our political philosophies and then use the algorithms um, as finding the most efficient means to, to get to that point. We need to make decisions um, not based on um, 
because this policy is going to actually get us into a surplus or uh, policy B is going to get us into a deficit because that's not the underlying way that I believe policy should be come up with. Policy, policy ought to be based on your, your, your philosophy and your beliefs as opposed to it's, I'm, I'm deciding this policy because it costs that much. Um, and that, in a sense, is sort of where um, we tend to in, in our media discussions. So making the decisions by humans, but getting the computers to um, figure out the pathways to those decisions. We've sadly run out of time for more questions, but I'm sure um, we'll have an opportunity to ask them on the hallway track. Yeah, hopefully. sure. Um, Thanks so very much. I thank you for your very interesting talk, um, little representation of that. Thanks. Thank on you very much. LCA. And yeah, we'll Thanks. continue in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.